Nearly two years ago, the 14th Army reached the end of one of the longest and hardest campaigns in the history of war, the immortal struggle finally crowned by triumph in Burma. Since those far-off times, the men who wear the Burma star have gone their separate ways. But now, at the Royal Albert Hall, comes a day of reunion, the first the jungle fighters have had since VJ Day itself. Meeting on a day that must have recalled the Burma climate, 5,000 veterans exchanged memories and sang the old songs. And now the 14th Army's great leader, General Bill Slim, has a chat with his old comrades in arms. It's good to be with you chaps again. You look very much the same to me in your nice civvy suits as you did in your sweaty old jungle green. <laughs> and you sound much the same. Although this is a rather more commodious Barsha than many I've heard you sing in. The voice you've just heard was that of General Bill Slim, Uncle Bill as he was known to his troops. He was speaking to a reunion of 14th Army veterans in London at the Royal Albert Hall on the 5th of June 1947. My name is Robert Lyman. I'm Bill Slim's military biographer. And Slim was, of course, the man who had led the 14th Army to victory in India and Burma in 1944 and 1945. Now, those 5,000 men at the Royal Albert Hall knew exactly who Bill Slim was, of course. He was very well known in the Far East, but he wasn't known very well anywhere else in Britain or the Empire. This was because during the Second World War, the operations in the Far East received much less prominence in the press and in people's considerations generally than the war against the Germans in Europe. This, in fact, had been agreed between Churchill and Roosevelt, the Germany first policy, in December 1941. As a consequence, the men who fought in the Far East throughout the war considered themselves the Forgotten Army. And Slim was the Forgotten General of the Forgotten Army. In this podcast, I'd like to introduce you to Bill Slim and explain some of the reasons why I think he was a remarkable general, in fact, one of the greatest British generals of the war, and indeed of all time. One of the most fascinating things about Bill Slim is that he was an unexpected soldier, and indeed he was an unexpected general. The First World War gave him the opportunity to join the army. He had always been very interested in the military and had managed to wangle his way into the University of Birmingham Officer Training Corps, not because he was at the university, but because his brother was studying medicine. And I think there was a little bit of subterfuge involved. That, of course, meant that when the First World War blew up, Slim was granted a commission in the Warwickshire Regiment, incidentally the same regiment that Bernard Law Montgomery was commissioned into. And he had quite an eventful First World War. He was wounded at Gallipoli, where he first met the Gurkhas, who he was to join in the early 1920s, and he was then wounded again in Mesopotamia. At the end of the First World War, he joined very briefly the West India Regiment and then was commissioned into the Gurkhas in the Indian Army. So he transferred from the British Army to the Indian Army. One of the most extraordinary things about this man, therefore, is that he didn't come from the normal school that you would expect British Army generals to come from. His family was lower middle class and struggling, and he didn't have the money. He didn't have the personal income that was necessary even in the 1920s to survive a military career in the British Army. The Indian Army, however, gave him the opportunity to live off his income. And he began a love affair with the Indian Army when he joined. The Indian Army was to be his home for the next 20 years. He did very well in the Indian Army. He went to Staff College at Quetta and became an instructor at the British Staff College at Camberley in jungle warfare. By the end of the 1930s, he was looking to possibly retire from the Army as a colonel. But the Second World War gave him the second big opportunity of his career. He found himself very rapidly promoted to brigadier and then to major general and command of a division in Iraq and Iran in 1940 and 1941. But he was still entirely unknown outside of the very insular caste of the Indian Army and would never have been expected to receive command of a British formation in Europe. The opportunity that he was given was perhaps a poison chalice. In 1941, December 1941, the Japanese empire invaded Southeast Asia, invading Malaya and taking Singapore and then Burma in early 1942. The situation was very bad. The British were pushed back on all fronts. 
Slim was promoted Lieutenant General and invited to fly out to Burma in March 1942 to take over command of the Burma Corps in order to fight what turned out to be the British Army's longest retreat in its history, a thousand miles over a hundred days back to India. Looking back on this now, I think even Bill Slim would have acknowledged that it was the retreat in 1942 that was the most significant part of his career and his most successful achievement. When the Japanese arrived in Burma, there was no expectation on their behalf that they would seize the whole country. And there was no expectation on Britain's behalf that the weak forces as they were would not be able to resist the Japanese. In fact, the Japanese pushed everything ahead of them. The success of 1942, ironically perhaps, was that although this was a retreat, Slim held it together. His two weak divisions fought brilliantly all the way back to India. But when Slim marched back into Manipur with his corps in May 1942, he was quite shocked at the reception he received. Many of those in India, not least of all General Noel Irwin, commander of four corps in Manipur, were very dismissive of the troops that had marched out of Burma and couldn't conceive of why they hadn't been able to defeat the Japanese. Slim and his soldiers had seen and fought the Japanese at first hand and knew that they were facing a formidable enemy, a new type of enemy, an enemy that, frankly, the British Army had probably never seen before. This is the first and most significant feature of combat in the Far East that Slim had to get his head around before he could conceive of a way of defeating the Japanese in battle. The Japanese were very well trained. Most of the army were agricultural laborers or peasants. They were hardy. They were fit. They were strong. They had trained very, very hard for operations in the Far East for the previous year. They were loyal. They were disciplined. They were very good soldiers. Their infantry was integrated with artillery and air power, and they had a preponderance of machine guns. So these very poorly trained British and Indian soldiers in 1942 in Burma, frankly, hadn't seen the like when the Japanese arrived in the country. So when Slim came back from Burma into India, he had to sit down and work out how on earth the British and Indian armies could ever defeat the Japanese in battle again if they were given the chance. The whole of that monsoon period, the monsoon rains began in the May and ran through till October. Slim was given command of 15 Corps, and he spent a lot of that time thinking through the issues associated with preparing soldiers for fighting this most formidable of enemies. He was a thinker. He wasn't dramatically well-educated. He had never been to university. But he was a thinking soldier. He had been to Staff College at Quetta. He had lectured at the British Staff College in Camberley. He had also, before the war, gone to the Imperial Defence College in London. He was one of those few very senior officers who had a very significant brain and was able to analyse problems in a coherent way. One of the products of that period of thinking was a recognition that anyone who wanted to succeed in fighting the Japanese had to be confident that they were fighting for a just cause. He called that the spiritual dimension. They had to understand how the Japanese operated and how best they could be defeated. He described that as the intellectual dimension. And they had to have the right equipment and be properly trained in order to be able to defeat the Japanese. And he called that the material dimension. So spiritual, intellectual, and material, they were the three legs of the stool which were required in his mind for defeating the Japanese. When the monsoons finished in October, November 1942, Slim then took the whole of 15th Corps and started pushing them through a very, very robust training program. He was determined that when his corps, because that's all he had at the time, two divisions, met the Japanese in battle again, they would perform much, much better than they had earlier in the year. And he came up with a list of eight fundamental principles, principles of fighting in forests, as it was called then, or jungle warfare. One of the things that the Japanese had done is they had managed to move much faster on the ground than the British. They had bypassed the British, who had tended to think about defence in linear terms. We'd lay out our troops in a line. The Japanese bypassed fixed defences, and they tended to move much faster than British commanders could think 
This gave British and Indian soldiers fighting the Japanese in 1942 a considerable inferiority complex that needed to be overcome. And I'll just quickly go through the eight principles that he came up with because they really have a significant bearing on the training that was then undertaken. He argued that the individual soldier must learn by living, moving and exercising in it that the jungle is neither impenetrable nor unfriendly. Secondly, patrolling is the master key to jungle fighting. All units, not only infantry battalions, must learn to patrol in the jungle boldly, widely, cunningly and offensively. Thirdly, all units must get used to having Japanese parties in their rear. And when this happens, regard not themselves but the Japanese as surrounded. Fourth, in defence, no attempt should be made to hold long, continuous or linear lines. Fifthly, there should rarely be frontal attacks and never frontal attacks on narrow fronts. Attacks should follow hooks and come in from flank or rear whilst pressure holds the enemy in front. Sixthly, tanks can be used in almost any country except swamp. Seventhly, there are no non-combatants in jungle warfare. Every unit and subunit, including medical ones, is responsible for its all-round protection, including patrolling at all times. Eighth and finally, if the Japanese are allowed to hold the initiative, they are formidable. When we have it, they are confused and easy to kill. The jungle was regarded by many British and Indian soldiers as a place to avoid. And in Slim's mind, quite correctly, fear of the jungle had to be conquered. The Japanese didn't particularly like the jungle either, but they used it to their advantage by traveling through it and bypassing British positions on the roads. One of the significant problems in 1942 was that the British Army was mechanized, had large numbers of vehicles, and was tied to what Slim expressively described as the ribbon of the road. Now, if you concentrate all your assets on the roads, they're easy to attack from the air. They're easy to attack by artillery. They're easy to bypass. Slim wanted to be able to get his troops away from this idea that the only way to travel was on the road. They needed to use the jungle in a much more sophisticated way than they did. One of the important things to understand about Slim's ability to think about the nature of the enemy and of defeating the enemy is reflected in these eight principles. But it's more than that. Slim's great legacy in terms of the art of fighting also extends to his thinking through the ways in which he could defeat the Japanese at an operational or even a strategic level. He realized in 1942 a number of principles that he would be able to put into practice in 1944 and 45. One of the hints to that thinking is in principle number three. All units must get used to having Japanese parties in their rear. And when this happens, regard not themselves, but the Japanese as surrounded. If he was able to ensure that when the Japanese bypassed British and Indian positions, if he could reinforce them and resupply those positions from the air, the Japanese themselves could run around as much as they like on the ground, but being unsupplied themselves would soon be starved and would only survive if they captured British rations and stores and supplies. This is an important discovery and a very important aspect of the changing approach to warfare in 1944. Slim recognized that at the heart of the Japanese military mind was this idea of constant movement, constant advance, constant offensive, and the idea that the offensive would win over everything. Slim realized he needed to be able to stop the Japanese offensive and prevent the Japanese from being victorious in the offensive. Now, this is quite a difficult task to achieve. It's best seen, actually, in 1944, in the Japanese invasion of Manipur, what they called the advance on Delhi, Operation C or Operation Yugo. General Mutaguchi advanced across the Chindwin with nearly 100,000 men in order to capture Imphal and to drive on, if they could, to Kohima and the Brahmaputra Valley. Slim's response was not to confront Mutaguchi along the Chindwin, along the forward edge of his defensive position, but instead he withdrew into the hills. He withdrew away from the Japanese he pulled the punch, as the old phrase went, because he knew that at some stage, very shortly thereafter, the Japanese offensive would be exhausted. 
Now, this was pretty bold in itself, and there weren't many people in the British High Command, certainly not in New Delhi, who were responsive to the idea of withdrawing in the face of the enemy. But he had proven in Arakan in February 1944 that he had a solution to this idea of blunting the Japanese offensive. If the Japanese offensive could be blunted, it would then exhaust itself in battle and better supplied and superior British and Indian troops would prevail. In Arakan in February 1944, it was done by aerial resupply. The troops withdrew into bastions and those boxes of defending troops were supplied by air and the Japanese offensive was blunted. In the same way in Manipur and Assam between March and August 1944, the British and Indian troops withdrew into the hills around Imphal and the sting was drawn from Mutaguchi's attack. Mutaguchi exhausted himself before his troops were able to strike the decisive blow at the 14th Army defences in Imphal. Now that took quite considerable courage. It wasn't the done thing, but Slim did it because he had asked himself, how could I have stopped General Aida in 1942? Well, he had the opportunity in 1944 that dramatic success, both in Arakan and Imphal, when I talk about Imphal, also in Kahima, was blunting the Japanese offensive into India, destroying the offensive, and then breaking that offensive down and defeating the advance completely. What he was then able to do was to turn the tables on the Japanese and conduct an offensive into Burma. So Slim had much more in his armory than the ability to conduct a successful defence of India, he was also able to conduct a very successful offensive into Burma. In my view, this was one of Slim's great achievements and one of the reasons why he is one of Britain's greatest ever generals. You can get generals in history who are very good at the defence and you can get generals who are very good at managing the offensive. Getting a general to do both is quite unusual. It also requires a general who is able to think first and do afterwards. The story of the offensive into Burma in 1945 was a remarkable story of thinking first. Slim's initial plan was to advance into Upper Burma on the northern side of the Irrawaddy, the eastern side of which was anchored by Mandalay. Because the new commander of the Japanese army in Burma had defended forward of the Irrawaddy. He'd sent his troops forward of the Irrawaddy. Slim wanted to be able to defeat those forces in an open battle in countryside that would enable him to use tanks and aircraft, of which he now had a significant superiority over the Japanese. He discovered in December 1944 that the Japanese had withdrawn their troops from the northern side of the Irrawaddy, and Slim was then forced to think about another way of defeating the Japanese in Burma in what everyone recognised to be a decisive battle around Mandalay. Slim was able to persuade General Kimura, who was the new commander of the Japanese Burma Area Army, that he was sending the whole of his 14th Army along the Irrawaddy to Mandalay, whereas in fact Slim was doing nothing of the kind. Slim was going to send his 4th Armoured Corps across the Irrawaddy far to the west to strike underneath Mandalay at Mectila. General Kemmerer didn't see this coming and was taken utterly by surprise. It was the spectacular victory that secured Burma for the British and Indian armies in 1945. One of the extraordinary things about Slim was the ability he had to relate to soldiers. All the soldiers who came across him, who knew of him as their commander in the 14th Army, remarked on this. In early 1945, George MacDonald Fraser, who was to become a novelist of some repute after the war, and of course the author of the famous Fleshman series, was a lance corporal in the Border Regiment. He came across Slim when Slim, as the commander of the 14th Army, came to visit his troops in Burma. His memory of the occasion is remarkable. This is what he said. The biggest boost to morale was the burly man who came to talk to the assembled battalion by the lakeshore. I'm not sure when, but it was unforgettable. Slim was like that, the only man I've ever seen who had a force that came out of him, a strength of personality that I've puzzled over since. His appearance was plain enough, large, heavily built, grim-faced with that hard mouth and bulldog chin, the rakish Gurkha hat 
was at odds with the slung carbine and untidy trouser bottoms. Nor was he an orator. His delivery was blunt, matter of fact, without gestures or mannerisms, only a lack of them. Slim emerged from under the trees by the lake shore. There was no nonsense of gather round or jumping on boxes. He just stood with his thumb hooked in his carbine sling, telling us informally what would be in the reflective way of intimate conversation. And we believed every word, and it all came true. I think it was that sense of being close to us, as though he were chatting offhand to an understanding nephew, that was his great gift. He had the head of a general with the heart of a private soldier. Slim was able to persuade soldiers that he had their best interest at heart. He did this unconsciously, perhaps, by drawing them into his confidence. There's another not very well known, but fabulous account of Slim talking to a Gurkha battalion along the Chindwin in December 1943, three and a half months before the Japanese invasion of India in March and April 1944. Slim came to talk to all the men in the battalion. They spoke at least three languages, and Slim was able to talk to them in English and in Gurkhali and in Urdu. He told the battalion, and this is recorded by a young officer called John Twells in a memoir that's recently been published called Unto the Hills. He told the men that he knew for certain that the Japanese were coming, they were planning to cross the Chinwin with at least two divisions, and they'd be making for Imphal. This is quite extraordinary because he was telling this Gurkha battalion what was going to happen three months before it did, bringing the men into his confidence. He explained the plan to them. He said, when the Japanese come, we're not going to fight them here along the Chinwin. That would give them every advantage. We are a long way from Imphal. The road, as you know, is very rickety. It's going to be very difficult to supply. It's going to be difficult to provide air cover. What would be much more sensible, he said, is to withdraw unto the hills. And here he was referring to the hills of Manipur, which stood behind him. His plan was to withdraw the defensive troops of the 14th Army, away from the Chinwin, into the hills, and there fight the Japanese, where they were strongest and the Japanese were strung out and weakest. And in bringing the troops into his confidence, he persuaded them that it was doable, that they would win. This is exactly the point that George MacDonald Fraser was making. The soldiers heard him describe what his plan would be in very simple terms. It came to pass, they did defeat the Japanese, and anything was possible. This phrase, talking to an understanding nephew, really does sum up the way in which Slim communicated with all ranks. There were no airs or graces about him. He was very matter-of-fact. He was respected for it, and the troops loved him because of it. One thing no general can ever avoid is relationships upwards with senior officers and politicians, and of course with more junior ones as well. Slim was a master of relationships, both downwards and upwards. Mountbatten had his back. Mountbatten came out at the end of 1943 to be the supreme allied commander, Southeast Asia. Mountbatten and Slim got on particularly well. Mountbatten realized very quickly that he could trust Slim. All his recommendations were sound and sensible. Not only that, he delivered the victories in battle that Mountbatten so needed for his own credibility. But there were a number of very prickly command relationships in the Far East. One was that between Slim and Wingate. Major General Ord Wingate commanded two expeditions of fighting forces known as the Chindits behind enemy lines, Operation Longcloth in 1943 and Operation Thursday in 1944. Another was with the commander of the American forces, General Vinegar Joe Stilwell, and the other was with, ultimately, Slim's own boss, General Oliver Lease. Slim actually got on reasonably well with Wingate. Wingate regarded Slim to be the only man on the side of the Chindwin that didn't want him dead. Although Slim's views of the Chindits and what they could achieve were very different to Wingate's. Slim also got on very well with the Americans and with Vinegar Joe Stilwell, even though Vinegar Joe had a very difficult relationship, not only with other British officers and commanders, but with Americans as well. 
the one relationship that really went badly wrong was the relationship with the incoming commander of Allied Land Forces Southeast Asia, General Oliver Lees, who had come from commanding the 8th Army in Italy. Lees attempted rather cack-handedly to sack Slim. The effort didn't work. Lees was himself sacked and sent home to the UK, and Slim took over command of Allied Land Force Southeast Asia and Lees's place. Then we come to the end of the war. Slim did not regard himself as a rank climber. He wasn't a soldier in order to be able to climb the ranks, and he didn't aspire after commanding the army that he was ultimately given, the largest volunteer army in Britain's history. During the Second World War, the Indian Army which provided the vast bulk of the 14th Army, provided two and a half million men under arms between 1939 and 1945. Slim came back to the UK at the end of the Second World War and retired from the army and was only brought back in 1947 by Attlee to become the new Chief of the Imperial General Staff when Montgomery moved on to a role in Europe. So this sepoy general rose from being a private soldier in the Birmingham Officer Training Corps to a commission in the Warwickshire Regiment to a career in the Gurkhas and the Indian Army to command of the 14th Army in the Far East before becoming the Chief of the Imperial General Staff in the United Kingdom. A remarkable journey for a remarkable man with opportunities only given to him by the First and the Second World Wars. This is the sort of man who would never have made a success of a peacetime career Without the advent of the Second World War, he would most likely have retired as a full colonel to Brighton or somewhere like that along England's southern coast. Slim is being rediscovered, I think, in the British Army of today. He's generally remembered for two reasons. The first is his remarkable impact on the lives of the soldiers he commanded and their morale, his role in leadership training and developing the rounded soldier who is able to live and succeed in the battlefield and to have confidence in his and her abilities to defeat the enemy. The second legacy is his approach to war fighting, which was to stress the importance of using subtlety and guile and of attacking the enemy's weaknesses rather than his strengths. We don't necessarily want to think about defeating an enemy by lining up our tanks and our aircraft and our troops in an effort to overwhelm the enemy in an attack of the kind we've seen in previous generations, but a more subtle approach that focuses hard on defeating the enemy where he, the enemy, is weakest and where we are strongest. Again, this goes back to the point about thinking deeply about who the enemy is, where the enemy is, what they're trying to achieve, and doing the thinking bit first. I think that's the most important legacy Slim has left us. Do the thinking before you do the bludgeoning. Well, how do we sum up Bill Slim? The historian Frank McLean has argued that there are solid grounds for asserting that when due allowances have been made, Slim's encirclement of the Japanese on the Irrawaddy deserves to rank with the great military achievements of all time. Anthony Brett James, a historian of the campaign who served under him, said, Bill Slim was to us a homely sort of general. On his jaw was carved the resolution of an army. In his stern eyes and tight mouth reside all the determination and unremitting courage of a great force. His manner held much of the bulldog, gruff and to the point, believing in every one of us, and as proud of the forgotten army as we were. I believe that his name will descend into history as a badge of honour, as great as that of the old contemptibles of 1914. Lord Mountbatten claimed that despite the reputation of others, such as perhaps the renowned self-publicist Montgomery, it was Slim who should rightly be regarded as the greatest British general of the Second World War. I would go further and describe him as Britain's greatest ever general. Let me leave you with Slim's message to the troops of the 14th Army on the 8th of April 1945, following those dramatic victories at Mandalay and Mectila. You have won the battle for Central Burma. It has been no easy triumph. You have won it against the obstacles of nature and against a numerous, well-equipped and vicious enemy. You have earned victory by kill, boldness and resolution. 
and by your refusal to let difficulties overcome you, by your dream, endurance, your unquenchable fighting spirit, and by your magnificent audacity. We have advanced far towards a final victory in Burma, but we have one more stage before it is achieved. We have heard a lot about the road to Mandalay. Now we are on the road from Mandalay. The Japanese are mustering their whole remaining strength in Burma to bar our path. When we meet them again, let us do to them what we have done before, and this time even more thoroughly. We'll meet again, don't know where, don't know when, but I know we'll meet again, some, some.